Hi everyone, welcome to this new workshop of the Applied Stat and Programming uh, Committee. Today we will have a session on data visualization given by Cedric Scherer. He's a data visualization designer, consultant, and instructor for engaging and effective graphical storytelling. With this, I will pass the word to Cedric. So thank you, Cedric. Here we go. I was just searching for the microphone. Hi, nice to see you all, or at least to have you with me uh, to this remote session on data visualization. Um, you may notice a different title here than um, in the announcement. We never really agreed on one. From the description, I decided to go with the title Visualizing Information with Confidence, Principles and Best Practices to Tell a Story with Data. Uh, this session will be covering like traditional steps of creating graphics, a few tips, a few tricks, a few principles, as the title says. Um, just to let you know, whenever you feel like you have a question or a comment on a topic, feel free to kind of like indicate that you're having a question on Zoom. There's this nice feature of raising your hand. And if I don't see it, feel free to speak up. Uh, that's totally fine. We will have a short exercise in between. If you want, we can also have a, a more discussion on, on a few topics here. Um, I try to keep it within one and a half hours so you can ask some question afterwards if you have some. Okay, with this, um, a welcome from my side and a short introduction. Um, as mentioned, I'm working in the field of data visualization and information design. I do consulting work and design work for clients. I also do coaching like this seminar here. And most of my visualizations, I still code. So I'm not sure how relevant this is for you. I think if, if at least a part of the group is also using R and ggplot. So you may have noticed already these hex stickers on my laptop here. So that's what I'm using most of the time. And I'm by, I'm by training an ecologist. Um, I went into computational ecology for my PhD project. And here are some of the figures, the first figures I've created for my scientific publications within this PhD project, all done with ggplot2. And during that PhD, I realized that I kind of like creating graphics. Um, was already thinking about graphic design um, studies before going into life sciences. So um, I became a part-time freelancer. So here are a few excerpts from work I've done. So um, in the upper left, for example, in um, collaboration with the Scientific American, the middle map is together with, with the USGS. So these are digital products, mostly the Scientific American also gets printed. And you see in the lower part also that, we, that they're mostly doing static graphics or sometimes even printed or at least PDF reports or to be featured among the web page. Also do quite some dashboarding and other stuff, but if I, I truly like to work on the static graphic to really work on the details, as you can see, I love to play around with colors and fonts. And how this all started was basically the PhD when I found out about ggplot2 and then also the kind of several challenges like tidy Tuesday and the 30 day map challenge and 30 day chart challenge, make over Monday, several of them around. And most of them have the same idea of giving you data or a topic and then you can work with that. So here are some examples from these. Um, I collected quite a portfolio during that time and then um, used that as a, as a starter for becoming a freelance uh, designer and specialist. So that's just something, if you're interested in these kind of things to see what other people can do um, with, no matter if it's ggplot or Python or Tableau, um, check out these, these challenges. I can also tell you a bit more later if you're interested in that. So I have a um, blog where I'm very irregularly posting some stuff, but I wanna highlight a few things which are especially um, interest interesting, hopefully for people who work with um, ggplot2. So I have this tutorial for beautiful plotting in R, which now features around 300 ggplot examples where you kind of like walk through, or I walk through what kind of things you can do, how to stylize them, but also how to create some uh, specific chart types and so on and so on. And this currently serves as the basis for a book I'm writing, but this will still take a while. So no advertisement for that. Another post um, for ggplot users is the evolution of a ggplot um, yep, article where I explain um, some of the considerations design-wise, chart type-wise, and also from a code perspective, why I've created these lollipop jitter plot, we, how we call them now. You may have seen it already. This kind of like was floating around at least in the R community for quite a while. 
And finally, I was teaching this year, but also last year at the RStudioConf or PositConf um, and the two-day workshop and also the new workshops from this year are freely available. So if you feel like you want to learn more about ggplot2 and how to create such graphics, it's um, available on GitHub as a own web page with examples and um, exercises, solutions, and so on. Okay. With this, I jump into the content of the day, enough advertisement. So we are going to talk about data visualization. And data visualization, I guess every one of you has an idea of a particular graphic in mind when I say data visualization. And there are also tons of definition floating around. So one definition is, for example, that data visualization is any graphical representation of information and data. This includes also infographics, like these poster type um, yeah, graphics, it also includes all kinds of maybe childish collection at the beach or in the in the children room, um, sorting Lego stones or something like this. Um, we have information data all around us, so this makes clear this is a very general topic. To define it maybe more in the context of why we want to use this um, as a tool, we aim at least for one of the goals which I've listed here, amplifying cognition or gaining insights, discover, explain, and or making decisions. From a more technical perspective, we could say it converts information, and here information means essentially data, into visual forms as quantifiable features. So this is more for the people who are like, well, I want to exactly measure the, um, the value of a given point. We will also discuss which chart types and which encodings are useful for that and which or maybe should be avoided for here. Um, so this is more on the yeah, academic research or maybe on the business end, but we will also see some examples which are showing you the large uh, variety of data visualization types. And you could also put it more philosophical, like data visualization is part art and part science. And that's obviously you as scientists, um, hopefully also have a sense for art. We don't make to make, need to make everything super beautiful, but I think just a bit of care also on our scientific communication um, increases the chances that we can like are seen, that we can like get recognition for our hard work. So this is also something I wanna show you how you maybe want to consider different design aspects when creating charts. So when I was thinking about data visualization, I was mostly thinking of these blackboards or whiteboards in office rooms you see on some sitcom media or whatever. They are hopefully gone, most of them, but you still see them as examples. Um, several of my clients still come up with these, rarely with 3D graphics, but um, nevertheless with often a lot of bar charts, many, many bars next to each other, very colorful bars, things like that. Also pie charts is a topic. I don't wanna to focus too much on that but there are certainly often better solutions than using a Python and especially not a 3D version of it. As a scientist, as a trained scientist, I might also think um, of a data visualization mostly like this. So some trends we wanna see in the data, some relationships we wanna reveal. So this is just a random scatter plot with a linear fitting here. Not wanna spend much time on the topic. I don't even know much about it. You can see what's, what's plotted on the axis just more like as a template from a, from a basic um, publication in the science field. Some people might even think of these fancy dashboards. If you Google for data visualization or dashboards, you often end up with these futuristic looking um, designs. Also on the announcement I saw, there's also kind of like a dashboard, colorful uh, set of visualizations. So there's a broad range. These often consist of many, many charts here, definitely also. Um, multiple things here, which are likely problematic, too much going on on this dashboard. As you, as far as I know, are not really dashboard people. I'm not going to spend much on um, kind of like designing nice looking dashboards, but there's certainly also some effort you can make. Coming back to collecting stuff at the beach, this is a project by um, three colleagues of mine, which is called Perpetual Plastic, where they actually collected plastic, um, then, um, yeah, this is not the numbers from the beach, this is general numbers um, showing with these artistic visualization, making, making um, raising some awareness on the topic of plastic waste in the oceans. You could also go even more artsy. These are the Patrick Kingdoms by Nadi Bremer. These are also actually encoding um, actual data. So uh, shortly summarize this, these uh, kingdoms show the number of schools connected to the internet and not connected, so the underworld, uh, schools which are not connected to the uh, to the internet and the upper 
part of the castles. This is um, these are schools which are connected. And then there's some algorithm to place these colors and so on. And some of the symbols also have meaning, but not going into that. I will share the slides later with you. Um, so feel free to click on the links in the bottom if you're kind of interested in some of these projects. So if we would now be together, I would ask you to raise your hand if you know this graphic. Um, usually not many people know this graphic. Um, so there's a bit of data with history. It's definitely not extensive here because we wanna focus more on the current tasks of designing and um, communicating the results. But this is a, kind of a, a masterpiece and a milestone. So this is a, a map by Charles Joseph Minar from 1869. So quite old by now. And this was often, well, from some people um, entitled the best statistical drawing ever. Um, often people in the room then um, have different opinions on that, but for database people, especially if you're kind of an Edward Tufty reader, which is a very known person in the data visualization field, he is a big fan of this visualization. And I think looking at the time when it was produced, it's quite some impressive work. It's kind of like a, a flow diagram. So what are you seeing here? The width of the streams is showing the numbers of soldiers in, Napole in the troops of Napoleon and brownish color shows the path to Moscow and the black shows the path back. And this is actually a very kind of reduced map, but it's actually a spatial setup here. And then in the lower, you see the temperatures on the way back. So map to the um, certain positions on the black stream because not all of the um, deaths or most of the deaths were not related to, to the war actions, but actually to weather uh, to the coldness, the icy weather, and diseases. Just a side fact here, because many people uh, don't know this, this is actually um, just one map of a panel of two maps. So the upper map shows the same thing for troops of Hannibal, um, but there's only the way towards their aim. And then the lower one is the one we have just discussed. And Nina did kind of like these type of graphics quite often, like some, some type of flow chart. So here you see the transport um, of livestock, of different livestock encoded by the colors to Paris during that time. And he was a statistical engineer and a lot involved in transportation, um, human transportation, but also transportation of goods. And also you see this inset map where he highlights with um, this pinkish color, which um, regions of France um, are, have joined the, the number of um, areas which are now transporting livestock to Paris to showcase that um, due to the to the building of railroads, uh, railways, um, these kind of, um, more distant areas were now connected to Paris. And he also did some other fancy charts. So this is one from 8045, one of his first charts. This is actually um, also showing some kind of flow. This is um, indicating transport of goods along the uh, canal in Paris as well. And actually it's quite interesting because the x-axis shows the distance of the, um, the travel of these goods. And then the y-axis shows the um, amounts and which means like that the area um, has some, some meaning as well. And also it's pretty interesting that he has written back then or said back then that um, he shows or he's kind of convinced that these kind of visualizations show promptly what written numbers only give slowly by arithmetic multiplication. I think this is some important thing here. We want to chart something to tell a story to make the insights more quicker, more easy. And so we should also always aim for that. This is maybe not the best example for this because you kind of need to dig into that graphic for a moment to understand it. But I will give you also some other examples. Okay, we now have a short mental exercises. Usually, if you would be in a room, I would let you draw that, but now you can just think about it and then I will talk about the solutions. If you, if you want to share what you think um, is the answer for yourself, then you can also share that in the chat, but it might be a bit more difficult. So the question is, if the year is a circle, where's March and December in your mind? I give you a short moment to think about it and then we'll continue with the results. Okay, maybe you have drawn a circle now and indicated these positions or just in your head. 
there's two things about that. Where's exactly the position and then also in which direction are you reading the year, clockwise or anti-clockwise? Now you might want to think about what is, how is this related to data visualization? Well, first of all, I'm going to show you a data visualization, um, which is using this concept. And secondly, it should make you aware that when you now discuss to colleagues or ask these questions to other people, that many people have different ideas of this mindset or this visualization of the seasonal time, which we call a year. And this is maybe, well, in the best case, meant as a reminder that just because you are thinking like this makes totally sense, not necessarily the setup other people have in mind. Let's look at some data visualization. So this was actually a project um, by um, Lang and Hofstadt, which is published in a psychology journal. And here you see the distribution of those people they have asked of 76,000 people where they place December and March around the circle. And now your points may fall within these um, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, one o'clock slices, or maybe three o'clock slices for December. Same for March, or you might be placed in some areas where it's completely different from what, are, what most people think. And then as mentioned, depending on where you place it, it might be counterclockwise or clockwise. So it turns out most of the people, three, um, three four um, of the people can kind of read it clockwise, but there's still quite a group um, of counterclockwise people and even people who don't really have an idea about that. So a bit more of data visualization history. This is a graphic by Florence Nightingale. This is an important piece because um, it's also a very old visualization and became a very famous visualization. It was definitely uh, meant to kind of raise awareness. So this is a very unusual chart type even nowadays. Um, I will come to that in a second. Um, the main point here was that the, the numbers were also presented as bar charts and as tables, but she wanted to use an um, extraordinary chart to really raise awareness and to make her point clear. You can, in a, in a minute or so, then decide if that worked or not. I think with this annual chart type alone, it's kind of like um, pretty fancy, and especially back then in 1858. So Florence Nightingale was working in, in, um, in the health, in the context of health during the war, and she wanted to raise awareness that um, due to um, 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 using hygiene metrics in the in the um, hospitals and removing that that bodies especially animal bodies then the survival of the soldiers can be increased by far in these field hospitals so what you see here is actually um, a clockwise indication of the year 1855 on the on the right side and 1856 on the left side and here it starts in april so at um, nine o'clock on the right side, and then you see the numbers rising. So blue, are, um, so all of these slices are, are showing by area the number of um, of dead soldiers, and then blue is the most important thing to look at here, which is due to hygiene problem problems and diseases. And then we go to the other side, and then she wanted to indicate that the moment she started working on that, which was in the middle of 1856, these numbers were drastically reduced. Oh, I think even she started even before, likely in March. She also did some other more basic graphics. So if you think like, well, this is nice to know and nice to look at, but this doesn't really help me in, in your publication, you likely should not use such a fancy graph. Um, we also see bar graphs and other chart types used by her. And um, it's quite interesting um, to kind of see when these were still hand-drawn, these graphics, but um, lots of the chart types we now consider maybe um, as a very common thing, but maybe even as, as a very uncommon thing have already existed back then. Okay. With the next section, I wanna make a case why we wanna visualize the, um, our data. I think this is clear to you. Um, I brought a quote by Enns Combi from 1973, who's, um, who said like, make both calculations and graphs because both sorts of output should be studied because they contribute to understanding. I think that's very true. We should not rely on graphics alone. So a graph alone might not make um, kind of the, um, really indicate the effect size um, of, of our actions and so on. So statistical measurements are definitely important, but also at the same time, statistical calculations alone will not help us to reveal all of the patterns and maybe also not to com communicate it that precisely. So this is um, a more recent and pretty famous example of that, um, that statistics alone will not help you. It's called the data Saros dozen. 
So it's a, it's um, 13 data sets, which all have the same summary statistics. So the same average and standard deviation along the axis. And because of that also the same correlation. And as you can see, many of those are likely not linear patterns. We also have a T-Rex in here and a star and some other shapes. So this is a playful variant of a, of a classic, which is called the Ns Combis Quartet, where we see these four different data sets, which again have the same summary statistics, but only one of them really um, should maybe, um, well, to only one of them should may likely um, a linear fitting applied. So in the second one, we have a nonlinear pattern and then three and four show outliers where we maybe want to take care of those um, before or during our analysis. An applied example, um, why visualization can help us in, um, yeah, in, in a more applied fields here is this um, study by Kobach and Spielkin, which was then picked up by The Economist. So the graphic is by The Economist, not part of the paper. And here you see um, a scatter plot of results during Russian elections. And the most important part here is already highlighted with these dashed lines, where you see inside these upper parts of high voting results, which were in favor of Putin, Medvedev, Medvedev and the United Russian alley, and that you see these um, distinct grid lines, which are, as the author state, a sign of manipulation. So this is actually now becoming more and more a standard that kind of like visualization techniques um, are used to kind of inspect data and the data integrity. So also there's now a job called data detective, which I find a pretty cool uh, job title um, in the context of scientific publishing, for example, that people look at the data. And of course they also look at the raw data and the tables, but visualizing these kinds of data often helps to spot some irregularities. So I hope I made a point why we want to use data visualization in the context of understanding our data. But at the same time, um, I also want to make a case why this could um, be helpful for you, kind of thinking about the visualization and how you visualize your data. And this can mean the success and failure in the context of communicating your findings, no matter if they're complex or not, but especially complex findings and phenomena. And it could be like you want to raise money for an organization or your department. You want to make a make your bring up across the point that you're doing a good job with these additional um, resources or workshops. You might want to present at a board or a conference, um, helping business or your institution to make informed decisions, providing guidance for improvements. So there are tons of things where you can use data visualization for. In general, it's always about getting your point across. So if we now say good data visualization, what does this mean? It's not as classic as the uh, black and white or good versus bad um, wipes here. So everyone who's into Avengers knows that these are both groups here are usually considered the good ones. And so this is the same thing here. We kind of don't or rarely have this kind of like, this is something bad, this is something good, but there's more gradient. And this is um, influenced by the context, the audience, the story you want to tell, and obviously also some taste and just decisions along the way. Uh, I brought four points here, which are claimed um, to be important for good visualization. Actually, it's not our. Please mute yourself if possible. Okay, here we go. Okay, four different points which are claimed to kind of make or are important for good data visualization. So, first thing is the data, the integrity of the data, the information level. Second part is the story. So what's interesting about your findings or about the data, why do you want to communicate? And that's very important to be aware of because it's really just about doing the numbers. It's really about like telling a story in my opinion. So it's very important that we don't put too much into our graphics, but enough to really um, transport the story, right? Mm -hmm. Then there is um, the, the goal or the usefulness. So this is more related to the chart type and also of course to, still to the data. So is the data useful to kind of tell the story? And then also is this a suitable encoding, a suitable um, chart to kind of like bring the point across. And then finally, it's about the visual form. I already mentioned something like beauty. We don't need to kind of like make it beauty in the sense of uh, very cute fonts and stuff, but I think removing distractions and really putting the, um, the, the highlight on the data instead of other things is often helpful. And 
unusual chart types or unusual colors or stuff can also be helpful to just kind of like make people aware of your graphic. These four points um, are inspired or directly taken from the Knowledge is Beautiful um, book. So here's a, is a fun visualization, what um, those people think, or David McKenna thinks, what happens if you're missing out of one of or several of them when creating a chart. And the su successful visualization is in the middle of this when chart. A when chart usually is a very bad idea to visualize. So I found this a fi funny finding here. Okay, the first part, and I hope you all know this, but I wanna recap a few things here on data integrity and potential pitfalls. So because it's data visualization, it's data is a very important part of it. And we should never forget about carefully taking, choosing our data and inspecting our data, you know, obviously also analyzing it. So there's really two main points I wanna raise here. So one is the data quality. There is guesstimation. Um, so people just roughly un, um, putting in numbers, precision, no matter if it's humans or machines and failures. There yeah, can be miscalculation errors, could be your workflow, but also maybe some uh, calculations which are done by a machine or kind of some other people who have pre-processed the data. Incomplete data and missing values can often be a problem and summaries and aggregations then uh, making um, very precise um, information out of these. It's sometimes difficult and there can be kind of things going wrong when aggregating data, obviously. The other thing is that um, our data is always uh, just a subset. So this is something um, when we are communicating, which we should keep in mind, right? So we should talk about reported crime, not crime alone. Crime is just a placeholder here. Could be also some other things, which I will point you to on the next slides. And it's always sh showing just the historical or present state. So this is more a reminder because if you're wading deep in your data and that's all of these things are likely also some things I already run into. Um, you might forget about it, so it's always a good idea to come come back or step back and uh, think about uh, the actual meaning and the actual source of the data. So as a reminder here, our data is never a perfect reflection of the world, which relates to the subset part. And um, as an example, I brought a fun visualization of some meteorite data, which I've created as a Tiny Tuesday contribution in, I think it's 2019 or so. This was a fun visualization, so it was more about like playing around with um, with the functionality of ggplot and um, creating these old school space observer design here. And I want to focus on the left side here, where we see the numbers of meteorites from 1500 to 2000 something. And there are two things here. The first thing is that we have very low numbers until 1800, almost 1800 or 70, 75 which is obviously not due to the number of meteorites which are falling on Earth, but more about the communication age and the rising um, opportunities and possibilities to kind of like record these meteorites. And then you see this drop at the end, which is um, definitely not a drop to, in, the, in this year, but this is something which I see quite often and also happened to me that um, people get excited about the latest data but forget that the, the year is not completely done, for example. So here it's the case that um, the last year of this line chart was not fully recorded yet. And as this is the sum of a number, it's obviously that in the last year, which only contains maybe here four months or something like this, um, it's not the complete number. But that's something um, I see from time to time. So it's a subset in terms of um, the complete data here, obviously what people can measure but also what people have reported yet. Another thing about the guesstimation example, this is um, the uh, penguins data set and it's showing a histogram of flipper length. I picked these very thin bins on a purpose to illustrate that um, some values seem to have irregular high numbers here, not a fully consistent pattern, but you see that often the five step measurements are um, more likely than some others. So this is now um, pretty similar to the example we have seen on the Russian elections. So these are just values humans like to use. And I would claim here that some of these numbers are kind of rounded in favor of harmony or however you want to call it. And then as an example about um, talking about subsets also explicitly, I came across this visualization at some point and it might be a, a, a nitty pick here but I was not really um, 
um, enjoying that it's um, setting an absolute state basically where are New York's rats, but actually it's about sightings, right? We don't know if the numbers of rats is that high because more people have seen rats there. Likely, as we know from rats, it's, it's a kind of like a combination of both. So where the humans live, there are more rats and where there are more humans, they also see more rats. But in general, we should be very careful in uh, reporting as well. So when picking um, an access title or chart title, here's another example using the same data set, which is much more clearer about that, talking about red sightings instead of um, where are the reds. So again, this might be a bit picky, but I think this is important, especially if we talk about uh, metrics where it's maybe not that clear to people um, how these numbers have derived. And it's easy to trick yourself, like saying like, well, there is this, this um, absolute complete truth in the sense of how we communicate um, what our charts are showing. Okay. Again, if there are any questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand or speak up. Feeling a bit like talking into the void, which is okay. Just want to know if you're still with me. And also, if you feel like I'm missing out on something, feel free to add that in the chat or speak up. Okay, perfect. So the context is related to um, different things. Uh, the first thing which we should clear about is like the type of information graphic we want to create. Um, here we are focusing on two specific ones. Um, the first thing is the type of information. This is, is, is the information conceptual or measurable? So this is more about is it an infographic or like a, a scheme or is it a data visualization, a chart in that context? We are focusing here on the measurable end of this um, gradient. And then there's another gradient, which is the purpose of the graphic. So is it about exploring or is it about explaining the information? So we are going to focus on explaining the information. Exploring can be interpreted in two different ways. On the one hand, um, exploring means obviously when you're kind of getting the data, looking at it internally, talking to your um, colleagues, finding patterns and the story to tell. And could be also in the context that instead of um, creating a graphic where we walk through, um, so the viewer gets basically the main points presented in terms of storytelling. It could be also that we let users explore our data. So basically starting with a neutral graphic and then by allowing people to filter the data or something like that to explore the data. Some people here, Alberto Cairo also um, suggested to make this a less um, a binary gradient makes the same binary gradient, uh, a two-way gradient in, by including another um, level of it. So um, not just exploratory and explanatory, which are for efficient and effective um, communication in a functional context, but also for effective visualizations, which now would include more like these playful artsy visualizations. So I think you all know some visualization which look like flowers and more on the emotional creative um, level. So the patchwork kingdoms, for example, would be also more in the effective context or this installation of the plastic amount in the scene. So in the context, there are a few questions you could ask yourself before starting to creating the explanatory uh, visualization you want to put in your report or at the social media or in your research article. So the first level is the who level, the audience. So there are a few more questions obviously you could ask, but I think the main ones is to whom are you communicating? And I, I just suggest to really think about that and to pre think about it more precisely than well scientific readers of this journal. But even the particular journal, right, um, gives or kind of gives you some hint of the knowledge, what they already know and so on and what they expect to read and to understand. And then if you're, especially if you're presenting to kind of a team where you know the um, exact audience, um, there's often a good, um, it's good to think about your position, your relationship within that context. So um, are you already trusted? Are you considered an expert? Do they know about your project? Um, are they kind of like friendly towards you because they are collaborators or they kind of might try to target you and ask you um, difficult questions on that? So this is something also to prepare yourself, but also to in, um, kind of indicating the level of detail you need to include into your graphic and how you need to communicate with them. So I'll give you some examples here. 
So it could be colleagues and experts. So these are more the scientific um, audience, right? They likely understand the topic, likely. Also, again, depends a bit on the field where they're working, how general the journal or the conference is, for example. And some of them might be friendly towards you. Sometimes some might be overly critic. Um, it could be also like if you're working a lot on social media and um, web presences and more like with the gray audience, uh, kind of like a, a, a bubble of people you don't um, know in detail, might be I termed in here spectators and critics. So there might be people who just love everything you do, or there might be people who just want to criticize you because you're kind of taking a certain stand. So we want to account obviously for both, but also in terms of feedback you uh, maybe should account for um, yeah, different levels um, of positivity and negativity towards your product. Uh, one example here being family and friends. If you're kind of having, having a nice family and a nice circle of friends, they hopefully give you a helpful constructive feedback, but at the same time, they might not be into the topic so much. So they like might like your visualization, for example, but um, give you a different feedback than the other two groups. So it's always a good idea to keep that in mind. And also when you look at other visualizations, kind of like we have seen a variety of different ways how to communicate with data. Not all of them are usually made for the same audience. The next level would be the what, so the content of your visualization. So some of the main questions to ask here would be, what do I want them to know or to do maybe? So it's not only about sharing insights, but maybe also to kind of like make a point and to suggest some action. How will you communicate with them? Very important, is it a report you send out and people read it on their own? Or is it something you present to them? Or is it someone on the, on the web looking at your graphics? There's a certain level, um, specific level of interaction with these people. So in the terms of a printed report of, or something you put on the web, you maybe want to add more context to it. While when presenting, you want to remove some context because you can talk and you can answer questions to these graphics. And then also, what tone do you want to set in your in your communication? So is it rather a friendly tone or is it something which is dramatically um, calling for action? And as an example here, just, oh, no, the example after the next slide, sorry for that. It's kind of like a new set of slides here. So first of all, um, when, when thinking about, um, communicating to these people and also not just the medium, but also in terms of what you can control. There's this scheme by Andy Kirk, which I have modified here, where we have on the left hand, we have the visualizer control. So this is basically you when you're creating the graphic. And then we have the viewer control on the other end of that. And in context of perceiving, so what do the people see who they look, um, which look at, the, at your graphic? And you have quite some control over that because this is what you put there. And we should like focus a lot on the, on this part, like how do pe people perceive our graphic? Because this is where we have the most control over. And then there's this interpretation level, which is in between what, what does it mean for the subject? Um, so this is where we can lose control. And then in the end, how they comprehend this information and how they interpret it, what it's, what it's meaning for themselves. This is something we want to control to some level by, guiding them and to not kind of pointing them in the wrong direction. But if there's like a certain mindset and they want to find out about, um, about a certain thing, they will kind of find a way to criticize your graphics. So it's also not something we want to make everyone happy, but those people who matter here, we want to make sure that they kind of come to the right conclusion. And about the toning, this is the, the slide I was looking for. It's um, already just the kind of the, tiny choices like colors and wording, which can already change the tone here. So this is an example about um, two maps here. The left map is a, a rework from a font text map and the right one is a, just a different, using a different color scheme. And you already can see how or likely uh, feel already that these maps have kind of a certain tone because red is not only the color of love, but also of war and aggression, while blue is usually known to be honest and calm. So kind of these are very different ways, at least to me. I'm a color person, so if you feel the same, um, this is definitely one of the claims where, that you should think about colors, even if it's only one color, not gradients only. And about the wording, um, already here, just the title changed. And already wording obviously puts a lot of, um, well, yeah, a lot of priority um, is on the title. And here you can set the tone, obviously, by pointing in one or the other direction. So there was a study, which um, not every detail of the study I loved, but 
in general, I think that that um, most every one of us is that the title is taking taking um, a lot of attention, and this is what people come um, come across first. So, um, so um, there was the study where they showed that, like I think it was half of the people, half of the group. Um, that whatever the title stated, even if the chart showed the opposite or no trend at all. So the title or being careful about the title is something important too, if you add a title anyway. But this obviously also applies to research articles, presentation titles, and so on and so on. Okay. And also the choice of the encoding, we'll come to encoding in a second, um, might, might matter. So here, what the scaling. So the, in the middle, you see the same arrows, but with a different scaling. So these are just becoming tiny, maybe too tiny for the, for the small ones. But again, they are changing the tone of these uh, maps. And on the right hand, um, there are bubbles used instead of these arrows, which again, change the message kind of. And then it's obviously also about like the the story itself, or how much do I want to include to bring my point across, or what's exactly the point. So this is just three different ways to show migration data here related to Europe. On the left hand, the original map in blue, but then we also have a zoom out version um, of like which groups we are looking at. So this is also about regular migrants, and then the, the on the right hand you see a graphic where it's about the timeline of migration events. So these definitely all tell a different story, but also are likely um, yeah, for different audiences and different contexts. And then the last part is the how. So this is the evidence here. We are kind of like back to the data um, level, the information level. So what data is available to make my point? This is basically also what I've shown you here. Um, you can obviously pick data um, and there's nothing bad about it if it underlines your point. At the same time, obviously, we want to be transparent. So um, we want to talk about patterns which really matter and not kind of like remove data on purpose to hide something which might be more important in the best case. And it's always a good idea also to prepare yourself in that context for the context. Um, when you're creating a visualization, also when you're presenting a visualization while designing that, you might also already think about potential um, criticism about it and maybe also counteract to it, proactively address it. So the main thing is, I think, if that's the only thing you remember from this talk and you think more precisely about the key message you want to um, um, transport in your graphic, this is really often, which I even, even in the context of data with specialists, I sometimes um, feel like that people are not very precise about that. And then it's kind of like a kind of a random chart which just shows the numbers without really kind of like um, focusing on a different thing or too much data in there. So really think about the one key message and then work hard on that to really make this stand out. Um, in general, which um, what background information or which, what information in general is essential and what's ir irrelevant. So this is something which I also often see in scientific context. If people collected a lot of data, they also want to show that they have collected all these data and we can put it in the appendix or something, but it's rarely a good idea to use a color, a shape, and the size of our bubbles to indicate three different variables. So often less is more. That's definitely um, a good rule here as well. And at the same time, think about your audience. So do you need more or less background information and also detail with a more expertise, skilled um, audience, you might also be able to include more levels of um, of detail. And also think about potential biases of your audience or some of your audience. So basically be prepared for kind of nasty questions and think about what factors could weaken your case and if you can address them proactively by a call out in your graphic that this is um, just a particular data set and you look at this because of and some reasoning for that, for example, or um, also adding an alternative graphic if you know that the people might be um, um, not really aware of, kind of how to read log scale graphics or may, might be even consider this as cheating, maybe come up with another version where you have a non-log scale and you can make the point why a log scale is important as one example. Okay. I mentioned enco encodings already and we have seen different encodings on these maps already. 
these errors versus the bubbles, for example. And I think you all have used different encodings. Maybe you have not named it like this. So encodings are data values which we map to visual or visual attributes which are mapped to the data values. So every ggplot user now um, should kind of like um, uh, be aware of like mapping data values to visual attributes. This is what we do with the aesthetics, right? And this is exactly what this is about. And to give you an idea of different encodings and how they work, here is just a random um, collection of numbers between zero and nine. And now we're using different encodings. Obviously numbers are also an encoding. Um, for example, we can use length. This is the classical bar chart here, for example. We could use the position, which is basically the same um, idea, but we are now indicating the end of our bar, not the length, but the end position. We can use the size as in the bubble chart, which is, we will come to that, likely not always the best idea, or you could use um, a color gradient in that context to show the range from low to high values. So there has been some studies about it. And if you Google for these, for these encodings, you will likely come across one of the these um, visualizations or info information graphics on what which kind of um, encodings are more accurate and less accurate. These are based on some studies where kind of they asked participants to um, first guess which group is larger than the other one and then to precisely name the difference of these groups. And these will likely differ a bit because people come up with various variants of these and they are floating around and there are also multiple of these um, studies on that. But a general idea is that position and length are on the one end and area, volume and color are on the other end. Here's another visualization of that and you can already see some similarities and some differences between the, the other one and um, this one here. So they show as the more, most accurate um, encodings the position along a common scale. So this is likely what we want to do, especially if you have multiple graphs next to each other. Um, but still, if we are using position or the length in that, um, yeah, so position in the context that they all have the same baseline here, I would still call the length metric, for example. Um, even if they are non-aligned, it's still one of the most accurate judgments because I can read the values from the y-axis exactly. And I just need to read one number. If it's length with uh, um, non-standard baseline here, then I already have to do some maths. There's some cognitive load on that. Direction then becomes worse and angle. This is what often is argued for pie charts. And when we're talking about bars and perception and um, the kind of like the effort people need to do in their head, uh, there's often a discussion about should the bar chart or chart in general always start at zero or not. And you will also find people and also in the data scene who say like, well, it's totally fine to truncate your axes. I'm definitely more on the left side here that you should for bar charts always include a zero baseline if it's truly a bar chart. Um, if there is a reason to not include a zero, then you likely should also not use a bar chart in my opinion. Some people argue that on the right hand, it's still not cheating with data because the numbers are correct, right? And here people need to do the extra effort to look at the left, read that the baseline is 300 and then kind of like calculate the absolute value of it or the difference between the bars. So while it might be true that this is not um, in a, on purpose misleading, it's definitely likely to, to be misread by people, especially if they just glimpse at it for a short moment. And I think also in terms of how our brain works, the, the one on the left is um, less, less likely to fail here because if it's really about the amount of ink on the paper and the height of these bars, this is making the point um, more precisely, right? We can really think about like different individuals. I always think of books or something like stapled on top of each other. And then this is a direct indicator. Here, they also mention like the numbering of the of these um, steps on the axis. That's definitely also good advice that we can like have these um, in harmony steps of numbers we already came across with the five steps. So usually we wanna have numbers like this, which feels more natural to us. If you wanna read more on the topic, there are a few papers on that and lots of discussion if you should have a baseline or not, a zero baseline or not. So here I link two papers, which you can have a look at, which also have like mixed results often and often say it depends. And I think really a, a very important factor here, which is often overlooked and also in these studies is the time people need to read off the, the, like the, the numbers or the, the time people are willing to look at your graphic. That's the other thing. Um, so there might be a lot of variation across your audience, how, 
how much effort this, um, it takes for them to calculate this and get it right. A fun take of this is this visualization by Nathan Yao. So here he's showing the impact of the baseline and that's obviously and exactly the same I showed you before. Well, you can come up with all kinds of patterns here to make it at the first glimpse, uh, make the difference very big or maybe um, yeah, just a bit smaller or very, very big. And uh, one example, if you kind of look for real life examples, often you just Google for Fox News data viz or Fox News bar chart and you will find tons of examples. So on the left hand, you see the adjusted graphic. I'm actually not sure if this was um, aired on Fox News or not. The white one definitely was aired. So you see here, there's not even um, a Y axis on the, on the right side. And one could even say like the numbers alone might be sufficient and we don't need to even need bars. But this is obviously um, at the first glimpse misleading. And then when you read the numbers, you realize, well, this there's not such a big difference, but the height of the bars obviously indicates a much bigger difference. So this often leads to the to the conclusion that we should always include a, a zero baseline. Um, this is also an interesting topic because there are definitely still people out there which claim that a zero baseline should be included in a line chart. Um, it again depends a bit on the on the story, on the goal you want to show here. If it's if the zero is important for some reason, or usually what I recommend is if my lowest value in the graphic is pretty close to zero, I likely want to include the zero. But if you want to zoom in into the true patterns and you have very high numbers, it's ridiculous, obviously, to include the zero because then you're not making the point. So often it's a good idea to zoom in if you have position and not length as the encoding. And I would even suggest something different here. So I don't really like that on this example that the line is starting at the very bottom of the chart. I often follow here the, the same um, idea Francis had. Um, and you can read more in this, blog, um, in this blog post here. But the idea basically is to add a bit of white space below your line chart if you're not including a zero baseline, because this then indicates, or at least like in the, on the first glimpse, doesn't look like your sales or your numbers or species diversity or whatever have crashed. So I think it's a good idea. There are multiple ways how to indicate. Some people like gradients to indicate that, which is definitely more fancy thing and not something you do in a traditional report or journal article, so there are multiple ways to do this. And he suggests roughly um, one third, so basically um, the golden ratio. Going back to our list of encodings and the accuracy of it, um, on the lower end, we find things which are for more generic judgments. So keep in mind that colors, color gradient, no matter which kind of color gradient, is very rough indication, very generic indication of values. So if you kind of have a scatter plot or something like this and you color your points based on or map another value to color, then you should keep in mind that this is the least precise um, information. So you want to keep those uh, metrics you find most important and you find um, which are, need to be uh, read off um, very precisely to put them on the axis and then add this um, third dimension for this, which is the least priority, basically. And we also see area and volume here, which um, is also something we often come across. So this is an example I've seen. This is also a real life example by the South China Morning Post graphic um, department. And this was when the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine started in 2021, correct? Two. Um, it's comparing the defense budgets of um, Russia and Ukraine in the year 2020. And if you look at a number and then you look at the squares, you might spot what's, what's wrong here. So they say that Ukraine's um, defense budget was less than a tenth of that amount of Russia's. And if we look at that, they use the side of, or the, yeah, the, side of, of the square and not the area of the square to um, showcase this. So this is basically uh, 100 times, or I think 140 times bigger than the Ukrainian um, square. So this is definitely something which went wrong. I pointed it out to them, then they came up with bubbles. Um, still not very, very happy with this visualization. I think um, there are some other graphics, for example, bar charts, which you could use to indicate that. So this is a rework from, from myself, just created for this workshop. And uh, you could even indicate here, I make this like money idea of slices here. 
from the bar charts and indicating that it's uh, for more than 40 uh, times the Ukraine defense budget. Or you could maybe just showcase the numbers or like the sentence they highlighted here. So this is a typical thing people often put on, on these posters, information graphics, posters, where kind of there are two, two very different numbers and then they're visualized as bubbles or something like that. And there's always the problem that people think about um, area versus radius. There are even some people claiming we should even adjust the area because our perception um, is not that precise and we should kind of um, add some, some um, factor of error to it. So there's lots of discussion about that. So definitely nothing which we can use for precise estimation. I mentioned uh, the color already. So there's also lots of things you, which can go wrong with colors. So here is the same number, um, the sequence of numbers. And now I show you four different ways how you could encode this with color. And some might easier, be easier to read and some might be less easy to read. So the first one is a desaturated grayscale, obviously, which is sequential. Second one is also sequential, but it's just using shades of blue. So it's a single hue sequential color set. Then we have one which is going across multiple colors, which is making introducing a lot of noise in that context here. And then we have a diverging one, which is also likely causing a bit of noise here, where one end and the other end is colored with uh, very intense colors, and the middle is colored with very light colors. So here's a version where I just show the full gradient, and now it becomes a bit more obvious. The first three are increasing in intensity, while the last one, the diverging one, has a middle center value and then is, um, is increasing in intensity towards both ends. So let's go quickly through them and uh, discuss when you should use one or the other. So the sequential one, no matter if it's only one color or multiple colors, is something we use for numerical information. Um, here, usually the recommendation is to use the dark color for the highest value. Uh, I don't like this definition for two reasons. The first reason is that we like the well, we, are, we are often interested in the highest value, but not always. So sometimes you might be interested in the lowest value, right? A perfect example someone brought to me in during a workshop was that his colleague was uh, using the darkest value for the highest p-value and almost white color for the lowest p-value. And um, if you're believing in, in significance or not, then you, um, if you're believing that you, you likely have um, also visualized p-values before and know that um, that indicating these by gradient where the where the lowest p values are almost invisible might be not the best idea or the other example i usually came up with is uh something like uh, sea sea depth or ocean depth where we might likely are more interested in the deeper areas than in the shallow grounds and the other reason why i don't suggest this as a certain as a, as a kind of particular rule that the highest value should always be the darkest is if you're working on dark um, back, backgrounds. So if you're kind of really implementing um, dashboards or web pages where you have a dark mode, you likely want to flip the color um, palette because then obviously on a dark background, suddenly the contrast is the highest with light color and not with dark color. So there's always this discussion. So this is just um, um, illustrating this case. And there's also some color sets where people have different opinions about it. So I think on the left hand, it's clear that the direction of the of the color palette with the dark colors being low life expectancy here on this map um, is putting a lot of focus on those countries. Where on the right hand, um, there's often a mixed feedback here. Um, this all, um, certainly also applies to color sets like Viridis, where we have like a yellow orange color on one end and the dark color on the other end. And often these yellow colors um, also attention grabbing. So for Viridis, for example, some people did a non official kind of like a survey on people asking them what they think should be as a as a standard and code more and there's a almost a 50 50 split that people would say like yellow because it's highlighting this data or obviously dark because that's the the, the rule so be careful with this and always think about and maybe flip these and just look at them or maybe ask your colleagues and friends what they think about it so this is an example if you put the same graphic on a dark background the picture suddenly changes well, on the on the left hand, I would still argue that the red one is still very prominent, even though it's getting dark. Um, if it's not, um, if it's inside the continent here, for example, it still gives a lot of emphasis because red is a warning color here. On the right hand, now I would argue that for almost everyone, 
the uh, light colors, the yellowish colors are popping out. So keep that in mind. The other type is diverging. So this is also for numerical information where we have a critical midpoint, which means that the midpoint, the, the light color usually should um, have some meaning. So it could be the, the average, obviously. It could also be a baseline. So it's often a ratio value, like zero baseline or 100%. And it's actually a combination of two sequential color sets. So in grayscale, the desaturated version, you will never find um, a set which really um, works in grayscale because by definition, the color intensity should um, increase to both ends and also in the same intensity. So there's often the question, which one is the correct one? And um, there is no definite answer about that. It again depends on your story. While with one, the sequential one, you focus on either the, the high or the low values. The diverging one obviously gives you a more nuanced um, picture and pushes the, the normal, the middle value range um, uh, categories into the background here, right? We indicate those countries with a high life expectancy in green and then those with a lower expectancy with this purple color in that context. So again, it really depends on your story. If you just want to talk about those which have a lower life expectancy, well, pick the sequential one. If you want to showcase like these are the highest ranked and the lowest ranked ones, then you likely want to use a diverging one. Again, if you do this on a dark background, um, you might want to flip these. So we need a dark middle color and then light colors towards the ends. So here's the same, but um, inverted basically on a dark background. And then talking about uh, the center value or the midpoint value here on the left hand, it's uh, the middle of the, um, of the full range here. And on the right hand, I have used the, the mean value and you see how it shifts. And the important um, point I want to make here, not saying like one is better than the other. Um, there might be reasons to use um, any of them but that you see that the very intense green now is gone on the right hand because we should make sure that the ends um, or one step to the left is the same as to the, to the right or um, they're going down one step is, so it should be the same as going up one step. So you see because the, the midpoint value, the dark color now is not um, perfectly centered um, across the range. We see that we lose some of the, of the um, light greens because we don't have as high values as we have low values compared to the average value. And the last um, type is the qualitative color set, which we use for categorical information. And this is often the most frustrating and confusing one in the end. Um, the rules are actually pretty clear because we, if we just want to kind of show all the data without highlighting a particular one, we want to have something, um, some set of colors which have the same perceptual weight. Um, at the same time, it often should be, or it should be um, colorblind safe, which limits the number of colors we can use for these kind of encodings. And you see here, this is one of the few um, color sets you can actually use, which are all of the same grayscale if you desaturate them. And uh, because of that, we're having a hard time to um, distinguish these kind of shades of color. You should usually, some people say even five, but definitely not more than eight um, categories, uh, limit your data to kind of, um, these number of colors. And then often there's the question like, well, I have more, what should I do? Usually the answer is, well, try to aggregate them or to remove some other categories to really kind of like follow this rule. It also obviously also depends if you're having a scatter plot or if you're having some other chart type. So also how important is this or how difficult is it for the viewer to match these colors to the geometry. And often if you really have like 10, 12 categories is often from my side, the recommendation to group some together as other. And if you still want to show them, you add a second graphic either next to it or in the, in the supplement where you show the rest of the information. Because usually, again, in a sense of storytelling and highlighting information, it's nevertheless too much going on, too much noise. So we likely want to end up with three or four colors maximum. An example of what else can go wrong with categories. This is just some made up data for four different groups here. Um, obviously the bar chart doesn't need to be colored. I will come to that in a second. But what I often see is colored bar charts in scientific publications where they use some sequential color sets. So this is a multi-use sequential color palette. Uh, you may know that one, it's Viridus. It's used quite often because it's known as to be um, nicely designed. Um, 
in terms of linearity and color blindness. And the problem here is, again, depending on whom you ask, but I think with this bar example, it's becoming quite clear that there's more visual weight on Europe and Asia compared to Africa and America. So because this is a sequential one, which goes from light to dark colors, we're putting more emphasis on the upper end. So if you grayscale that or desaturate it, then it looks like this. So here it becomes obvious, obvious that kind of like just the weight of each of the bars is very different. You could, of course, uh, map the color gradient then to the height of the bars. This is a double encoding. Some people say you should never do it. Some others are, are kind of like quite fans of these kind of techniques. I think here it's more confusing than helpful, but this is just a toy example. So here now you see that Europe is the highest. So the, the highest emphasis is also put on Europe, then Americas, Asia, and Africa. So this now is a correct use. Nevertheless, you don't, maybe don't want to um, double encode your bar chart anyway. So you could also go for just grayscale, which is definitely a perfect uh, use or solution for this kind of like a standalone bar chart. But if you compare it with a scatter plot, for example, it's a good idea likely to kind of pick up the same colors or introduce the colors before. So you have some consistency, also looks better. Um, so he, let's assume we have a set of two um, graphics. So here again, it becomes obviously that um, obvious that the geometry also matters. So I think while the bar is because of the of the high ink ratio, it's Still clearly visible, the points are harder visible. And depending on how you present this, maybe on a bad beamer at a conference, they might be completely vanish. If you're using now, you're on the gray only um, section, well, then you can't do much more than using shapes. And also the shapes are not really kind of like um, repeated or in your in your bar chart. Of course, I could add it to the labels or something, but it's not very intuitive. Also, as you can see, it's a bit harder to spot the patterns. So I usually don't recommend um, shapes alone, if then shapes and color in combination, because I hopefully we are kind of like, um, behind the era of gray um, scale printing. And uh, most people look at this hopefully on the screen. So if we pick in colors, you might want to end up with one of the few sets which have four colors, which are almost the same um, intensity and um, at the same time, also are colorblind safe, which is, as I mentioned, quite limited. Okay. So last two topics is about the choosing a chart type and then guiding the viewer. So uh, chart type choice, I'm not going through a full list. Um, I do this sometimes, but this is quite taking quite some time and we kind of like have a bit of time left, but not enough to really go through all the chart types which are available. Also, there are kinds of mixtures and hybrids. I'm a big fan of chart hybrids as well, like combining multiple chart types. You will also see a few, but I want to point you to some resources here. Um, one of the most popular resources, or especially if you Google for it, is this chart suggestions cheat sheet or however you want to call it, which I definitely don't like um, because it gives you the idea that there's always the one right visualization type for a particular combination of what kind of data you want to show and how many um, categories or which kind of variables along these axes. Uh, I think it's a bit more diverse than that. So I'm not really a fan of this. Also, I see several chart suggestions, which I would never suggest, like a circular area chart, for example, I would definitely avoid or to the area chart for particular reasons. So I like some of these a bit better. So there are tons of them here, just three. I present to you the database project is quite interesting because it's using the same um, data set for all of the visualizations. So it's one data set, 100 visualizations. At the same time, it's definitely using some more playful and less useful visualizations, but nevertheless, it's a good source for inspiration. On the right, the visualization universe um, also gives you some tracking about uh, the popularity and how much people used it over time. So they are also collecting some data on this and has a very neat overview. And my favorite definitely is from data to this. Um, so Jan Holtz is um, hosting that page where you also have this decision tree um, kind of idea. So there's also a poster you can order or download, but it gives you more kind of like a flexibility and provides you with several chart choice, um, chart types to choose from for uh, a given set of uh, variables. Um, plus on the at the same time, if you click on one of these chart types, it also gives you a short summary. It also 
highlights, which I really like uh, the common mistakes and how you could solve them. So in, in the context of the box plot here, for example, it says that you can't see the sample size. So you might want to add the annotation or play with the box width to in, indicate different uh, sample sizes, if that's the case. It also mentions that it hides the underlying distribution so that you maybe want to use a jitter on top or maybe a, add a violin to it if you have a lot of data points. And that's, for example, ordering box plots um, can make it a more insightful visualization. And then for those who are coding, you see that um, there's also code linked. So there are four more pages, web pages, the R graph gallery, one for Python, one for the JavaScript library V3, and one for Flourish, which is an online tool for interactive graphics. And here, Jan has collected examples. Um, some of them might be a bit outdated, but all of them work definitely a bit more complicated. So for a simple graphic in one of these programming language or one of these tools, and then also giving you a bit more advanced code to style these charts or give you multiple uh, solutions to create these graphics. So I think this is really a great resource and uh, feel free to check it out or one of the others. Um, one particular thing I want to talk about is these um, Baba plots or dynamite plots you see here in the upper one of this um, meme, data viz meme I've created uh, quite some time ago. Um, and why this is problematic. So the lower one shows a uh, rain cloud plot. This might be for many people too much information. The idea is here, we have a box plot, we have a half violin plot to or flip density curve to indicate um, the, the um, yeah, density of, of the data and then the rain, which is actually a jitter strip. Um, but especially there's lots of use of these dynamite charts and Baba plots. There's even an um, initiative People were um, writing letters to journal editors to uh, not accept any publication with this type of chart. I'm not sure if this is something you do in your research as well. I want to highlight a few things why you maybe don't want to use them and do something else. If you need to argue with colleagues or editors or reviewers about that, there's this nice uh, paper by Tracy Weisgerber and colleagues who have written the article Beyond Bar and Line Graphs. Uh, so this is something you can um, cite. This is published in PLOS Biology, um, but the, um, I'm pretty sure it also applies to other fields and there might be also other similar versions of these um, papers by now for your given field of research. And she's showing some of these um, graphics which are pretty common in life sciences um, and in medical um, context. So I still also often come across these kind of um, charts. And the problem here, obviously, is that we hide the distribution. We have quickly mentioned that in the box plot example on the data to this page. And she and, and her colleagues are now showing uh, multiple um, distributions, which all would result in the same dynamite plot. So here's a symmetric one, but there could be also an outlier, a bimodal or unequal sample size here. And this is similar to what we have seen in the very beginning, right? Visualize your data, the data source doesn't or ends come with quartet. And on top of that, um, these also give, depending on which test you use, and there's usually just one correct test for each of these distributions, give you different significance uh, in terms of uh, p-values, in terms of the 5% threshold, which I have indicated here by these two different colors. And then if you go for the test, hopefully it's correct. The test you should use for these kind of distributions, well, you see that we go from being significant to non-significant, non-significant, and significant again. And even if you can like um, have accounted for that and pick the right test, it might be just nice as an additional information. It might be also not always the most helpful. I also hear people saying like, well, now I see the raw data, but I don't see the summary statistics. You can still add them kind of as you like. Um, has, doesn't have to be like a rain cloud plot with all this information, but there are all kinds of combination of violin plot, error bars, box plots, jitters, bee swarms, and whatever. And um, maybe also combine that with the bar chart, for example. And this is one chart issue. I want to cover a few more, uh, which are hopefully helpful for one or the other in the room um, that you can handle. The first thing is the overplotting issue. And uh, this is just made up data here, but uh, might happen to you as well. If you have a large data set and you plot a scatter plot, you often have the problem that by turning down the transparency of these points, some of these points, if they're single individual points, they are just um, disappearing while I still can't see any pattern in where all the points um, are falling. And some solutions here, 
um, is the um, so-called point density. Um, you can already see that this is not perfect. I was not really fine tuning the algorithm here. So this is kind of like, um, oops, should not read count. Okay, can be count as well. But basically they are estimating the number of points which are plotted um, on top of each other or close to. And then the darker the color in that context, the more points are um, yeah, neighbors. You could obviously also create um, a grid, a tile grid here, for example, where we basically bin the data on both axes and then calculate the number of points within these. Obviously, we're losing some information because we can't spot which of these cells are single data points, um, at least not with this encoding here, but might be also a solution to highlight given regions. So this is basically a heat map. If you like hexagons, you can obviously also do this with a, with a um, hexagonal grid. So that's actually the same. And as the last solution, you could add some um, density contour lines here, which basically also indicates, so could be also filled. I always like to show the raw data nevertheless. So you see the full spread of the data, turn them, hope you can see it on the screen should be fine. Or Beamer should maybe increase the contrast a bit, but that you still can see the, um, full range of the data and then highlight where most of the data falls. The next issue I want to quickly talk about is the spaghetti plot issue, which we call, or which is the name for line charts where we have tons of lines which follow the same trend uh, or they're crossing each other where it makes it very difficult to focus on one or the other or even follow that. So there are multiple issues in this graphic. Um, so you see it's too many colors. The colors are also of very, very different um, visual weights. So you see that the likely most important line or one of the most interesting lines, which is groceries, it's hardly visible. And there's lots of stuff going on and you can hardly tell um, yeah, one pattern or the other. And um, yeah, definitely not what's the story here. So I brought a bit of different example here, giving you some ideas how you can handle that. And this is showing the life expectancy again for the G7 countries from 1952 to 2007 in steps of five. And here again, it's, it's very colorful. It's not really insightful. And we could um, solve that by using small multiples. I personally, I'm a fan, big fan of small multiples. You also have seen several small multiples in the beginning when I showed you some of my projects. And I think this is very nice to look at. You can focus on one at a time. They all have the same axis range, which is important here to make it still comparable. And if people argue, well, I can't really compare them. And now I don't know if France has higher values than Italy, for example. I always think it's a good idea also to add the, um, the other data sets as a background information. So here in the gray scale and less line width, um, adding all the other lines to see basically the ranking within these seven categories in that example. I created back then also a version with small multiples. I, nowadays, I find it a bit too busy, uh, but the idea is the same. So uh, I now have created um, a small multiple for each of these categories here in these um, spending categories. And I also decided to um, color the area under the curve or above the curve to indicate directly if the trend is um, negative or positive. And then also added all the other information as lines. Nowadays, I would likely, for example, remove the points for the background data here. Um, but in general, the idea holds like splitting up these data into multiples, often more insightful. And just to indicate and basically closing the loop that this is nothing new. This is a graphic by Charles Joseph Minar again from 1866, where he also used this uh, small motor approach to uh, indicate the transport of um, cotton across um, the oceans uh, with these flow diagrams and to highlight the change from, I don't know what the categories represent here now, from blue to orange. Um, the next issue would be stack bars. So this is a stack bar graphic, and there's always a group of people who argue that stack, graph, stack bars are a bad idea because you can't compare, especially the groups which are not starting at the zero baseline. I think this is very valid. At the same time, I think stack bars are wonderful, depending again of your story. So as a general rule, you can use stack bars if the main point is the absolute height of these bars, but likely you don't wanna use stack bars um, with absolute numbers 
if you want to compare the groups within the focus is of comparing the groups within each of these bars, then you should maybe go for grouped or dodged bars. And here, um, the obvious solution to that is that you could use a line graph, which then makes the position uses the position instead of the height, right? Um, I think also in the context, there's um, a lot of discussion if we should um, visualize yearly data as bars or not. So some people say definitely, some people are saying no, because it hides these um, this continuity of, of years at the same time, these are metrics for particular years. So other people argue, well, you should not connect the points with each other. So there's lots of discussion around it. Happy to discuss that if you want to, I'm not spending more words on that. In that context, again, you could also use small multiples and small multiples here would have even the additional benefit that we could get rid of the color here. So make it less colorful, for example. And depending if you like it or not, and depending on the data structure, you could also add the other data, the total here in the background, which again, might add too much noise or might be confusing for one or the other example. And again, take your pick, keep your audience in mind and the way you, the medium you're using to, to communicate and also maybe ask your colleagues and friends what they think. Is there a question? I oh, know Nicolas just joined. Hey there. Um, so one of the last issues I want to talk about is the skewed data issue. Um, so this might be also something you came across with your data. You have uh, some groups, so this is made up data again, which are uh, very present and um, others which are very low in terms of numbers. And then people often come up with something like these truncated axes, um, but also with like a gradient or more rut line or something like this, but nevertheless, they basically break the y-axis range uh, or scale in that context. And this is definitely always a bad idea. I've even seen double line breaks uh, in combination with box plots and all kinds of things. It's pretty wild out there. Um, so this is definitely something you should not do. I'm, I'm not a big fan of don't do this and do that, but in that context, it's definitely a fixed rule because we discussed already about the length as the encoding and we are basically corrupting ourselves. So we are making those numbers which are huge, making them smaller in favor of the small numbers. And if it's not about the small numbers, this is not doing us any favor. And the argument usually is, well, I can't see the other numbers. So there are multiple solutions to that. And just realized I didn't bring one of the solution. I wanted to add that. So one solution obviously is also adding the numbers to the bars itself. So even if the bar gets very, very tiny or almost invisible, there would be a number stating that there are three cases or three individuals or whatever. Another solution what people often do and should, you should not do is using a log scale. A log scale per se is definitely totally fine if your audience can read it or if you explain it carefully. But in that context, again, it's not um, really advised because basically the same holds true as before. You're basically corrupting yourself. You kind of like, um, yeah, by choosing this uh, transformation, you basically trick yourself because it's very, very hard, even though if you know what's the log scale to really kind of like recalculate these values, right? And you just get tripped into the idea that some of the categories are pretty huge compared to the, to the largest groups, which is actually not the case. For, for points, this is a complete different story, right? We are now talking about bars in this context. So what I usually like as a solution, depending again on the story and the detail you need to provide is putting together all these other groups as other. Obviously only if this total makes some sense. So here I just kept the three main um, groups and then show that all the other groups are not even half as high as the three bars of the main categories. If you still wanna show the other groups, I often suggest as repeatedly here in this um, seminar to use both two charts next to each other. So basically a zoom in chart, there are all kinds of how you could design them. I here just use a very basic one by encoding these with colors. You could obviously also have the zoom out um, visual things or um, add some lines to it or connect these two charts with each other. But in general, this might be a good solution if you really wanna precisely also report the numbers for the small groups. And the last issue here is the dual axis issue, which um, is about yeah, these very common chart types, actually. I hope you're not doing this. If then please consider to stop because um, these kind of uh, charts can be scaled in all kinds of, kind of ways. 
to make different um, different points. So here's just uh, four examples for different types of um, combined data where you should not do this. So it's sometimes the same unit, sometimes different units, sometimes different um, metrics even. And the only use case usually where you want to use two axes is for encoding the same thing, but with a different um, unit. So here we're showing the temperature as Fahrenheit and as Celsius so that people can pick their choice what they feel more confident to relate to. Uh, you might know this um, fun thing, spurious correlations. If not, check it out. It's a web page collecting examples of correlation is not causation. So here it's the divorce weight in Maine versus the or correlated with the consumption of margarine. And you can see that we can match it by just picking the right scale on one or the other if the overall trend is the same. Uh, what also happens is that people basically draw the zero baseline and try then to compare them to, to a zero baseline. That might happen if, if people are looking at that. But I find it more um, worrying that you can basically come up with all kinds of impressions. And again, it's the same idea as not including a baseline in a bar chart. You could argue, well, I have written the, the unit, uh, the, the exact labels, the numbers next to each, one in red, one in blue. So if people don't get it, it's their fault, but um, don't overestimate the time and also the effort people want to put in your graphic. And you might definitely want to have the full control in terms of the kind of the story you want to tell them um, comes across. And I think this is more, if it's on purpose or not, more likely to go wrong in that context and is, is more often used to really to do um, kind of cause, cause bad perception and then really kind of like uh, making it a better story telling piece. So solutions to that is again, using two graphics. Um, if you then argue, and that's what I usually hear is that you can't compare them both. And the first question is, do I really need to compare or want to compare them both if it's different metrics or different ranges of data? And if you want to compare them, then it might be um, an idea to create um, this kind of um, chart where you still use lines, um, but you transform them to per um, percentage change. So you have basically both lines starting at the same zero baseline, and then you can compare the trends of them, these two lines. And now we have the same metric and the same range on the axis and could, can put it on, on one chart here. Okay. Um, I want to stop a bit early. I can quickly go through the examples here. We have a few more minutes left, but I want to keep a bit of time for you to ask some questions and cover some other topics. So this is actually a pretty simple thing. And I'm also not sure how much it applies to your daily work. I hope also to see more guidance in um, scientific papers, for example, and general in communicating these um, findings, um, which is mostly about adding call outs and annotations to your chart. So this is one graphic, um, which is not the original from Information is Beautiful, again, where they show breakup times and data collection is a bit weird, but I wanna mostly focus on this line graph, which is maybe interesting because there are several peaks, but you now would need to do the work or, the, or any of you need to do the work or think about or come up, um, interpret this chart and maybe even comprehend or make really different clear. conclusions to it. So by adding by adding annotations to that, we make sure that make it one. sure that people don't get it wrong. And here is just very basic call outs of kind of like which events over the year are happening and why what the author think might be the reason for these increased numbers or uh, these very low numbers of breakups during that periods. I always like to quote John Bern Murdoch here. He's a data vis person at the Financial Times or data analyst and visualize, visualizer. And here are two of the graphics where there's a lot of text. So one is on the very early uh, corona or from start from the corona pandemic. And one is either um, rather to the to a later part of it where it's about vaccination. I think the left one, it's a pretty crowded detailed um, visualization. You can also see how they changed the level of information put into these graphics. At the same time, obviously, also kind of like painting the full picture, or some people would still criticize them for not um, painting the full picture of all the data they have available. But in general, they say like text and other annotations add an enormous value for the non chart people. So, also explaining your chart to people how to read it might be um, a good thing to do. 
if you have a very general audience or an unknown audience um, in a more more kind of like ex expert context, it might still be uh, useful to add call outs for the uh, take home messages and a bit more of data with history here. This is a, one of the first visualizations ever. There's kind of like some discussion what's considered a data visualization, but uh, some call it one of the first or the first by William Playfair, which is this line chart um, showing exports and imports of England. And I love this piece, it's from 1786. I find it um, very modern in terms of how it looks like, how clean it is, and in terms of colors be used and the level of annotations. So here by color and shading the areas, and then even repeating the wording of imports and exports and balance, balance against and balance in favor, I think is a wonderful piece um, showing precisely the number, but making it more exciting and also more clear what's, what's happening in these time series. Going back to our example of the um, spaghetti plot, now not showing all the data with small multiples, but focusing on a story. One of the main stories here is certainly that Japan is going from the last rank to the highest rank and quite some um, difference in the life expectancy in 1950 and then towards 2007. So we could make use of pre-attentive attributes, color and size. So here I'm using a, a larger bold um, text for the label. I also use a, a higher line width and the red color to stand out while I'm using this reduced gray colors for all the other. I don't even think about highlighting the other countries here because if the main story is Japan is better than all the others or took over the lead or whatever, then this might be enough information in that context. If you obviously want to compare it to the United States or whatever, you want to highlight these as well. And then you could even add some others like, okay, I really want to showcase it was ranked last, then it's catched up and then it's ranked first. So you could add it like this, for example. You could also indicate the periods or even color the line based on these different periods you have identified, all kinds of things but just having the confidence of adding this additional information just to make sure this is what I want to show and that you don't need to write about it or people need to come up with it um, on their own. And then you maybe want to eat, even add some more context or the, even though there's an axis, the absolute value of the final life expectancy, you might go back to the red version, would look the same, doesn't matter. And then maybe also calling out the general range here, I decided to just showcase the general range of the other countries because I don't want to highlight some of those. Going back to our vehicle registration um, stake bar chart, we could um, get rid of the legend, for example. This is something which is definitely some, still a uh, common practice in scientific context, but you could also add them to the bars, giving the data more space to breathe. And then in newsroom, definitely, and um, modern data visualization, but maybe also some examples from the 1800. Um, it's kind of like a common practice to um, indicate also to, to merge the title with the legend. So basically, color encoding the words which represent the given category, which is nothing I do in my daily work as a scientist, because we usually don't have a title and it might be a bit too modern, but also I usually like this approach and maybe even double encoding, but putting the emphasis already in the title because it's the first thing people read. So they already know what the colors represent. And then maybe even working here with shades. So kind of like putting the focus, the story, the emphasis on the last year here, where there's kind of like this 50-50 split while it was in favor of the gasoline and diesel um, cars before that. And giving more guidance here, some, some other examples, one from the Financial Time again, where they really explain not only the colors, what they mean, but also how to read it or what it means. So here it's written, darker columns indicate strong presence in the city while darker rows indicate broad presence of a bank. So really kind of guiding these people, this is a general audience obviously, but it's very interesting how many people can't read a heat map actually. Um, I found it out the hard way as well. So it might be really a good idea to guide people or just to give small additional indicators. So this is something which often comes up if it's about adding annotations and call outs. Some people, um, there's a, certainly always a group within my workshops where people tend to say that this is too much text, which is causing too much distraction. And I tend to agree on that. But I think there are lots of interesting additional information, uh, which I particularly love is this human relatable um, um, indicators of size here, because this is about million square kilometers. I think this is a nice indicator of um, what actually 10 million square kilometers represent. 
and then um, also that we can like um, see this very hidden additional um, shading here of these and annotation of these different periods to indicate that we are here on the northern hemisphere so talking about the arctic one of my own projects you have seen it in the beginning is with the, together with the usgs and here we decided to kind of show these points as a rough data um, on this on this um, map of the um, american states and then also detailed bar charts um, just for the counts of streamflow droughts of the most severe streamflow droughts and we kind of iterated quite a lot um, until we came up with these small inset maps here, which basically just indicate these different climatic hubs. So there are different climatic hubs, and you might not be very aware if your state is part of that or the other group. And we added like arrows, and this was like always getting getting messy and crowded, and also still wasn't super clear. And we had to work with the borders. And I think this was a neat uh, solution to just add small maps indicating in particular areas here. An example, which is not from myself, but from Jan Kuhn, um, is this about the, um, the, the richest 1% in the German population. And I love just this axis where they basically, he basically added also this kind of waffle chart with uh, individual icons here, um, indicating um, how many people are represented by each of the bar. Well, not how many, but the percentage share, which is a very, visual and enforcing uh, visualization even though these are plain percentage numbers i think this one tiny orange person indicating the one percent which is then picked up in the bar um, it's a wonderful example of using small additional things to um, make your point come across um, the last example for myself to just showcase that illustration might even make things more exciting. So you already sense that I'm not here with Edward Tufty all the time of like re removing everything which is not needed for your graphic, especially in the terms of social media and the fast living context we are well, world we are living in. I think also some some um, exciting elements which just uh, can like lead to um, that people stop by and take a closer look at your graphic is important. And here it's even informative. So what's actually the build I mentioned? Um, the bill ratio I have calculated here by this um, illustration by Alison Horst, or just like adding this fun coffee stamp here, I got a lot of positive feedback on that. And this directly uh, puts the context for people. Obviously, this is not something you put on a regular business graphic, but in terms of really kind of um, reaching a broad audience, I think this is just a, a visual hint which directly sets the tone of your or the topic of your visualization it's about coffee everyone recognizes that usually um, rarely got angry comments from tea drinkers here but basically like well this directly tells me this is about coffee here and it's a fun thing people wonder about then skipping the walkthrough you can look at that once i share the slides with you um, because of time i want to wrap up so I always like to wrap up with this example by the Washington Post, which is a single line um, line chart here. But nevertheless, there are tons of nice design choices and additional information and details to make this an exciting graphic and a very nice storytelling piece. And my colleague, Francis Gagnon, he has written about that and added these notes why he loves this graphic as well. So I think uh, without reading all about this, um, or kind of going through like all the details here, I hope this is a, is a nice um, example how you can even turn simple charts into something which is more informative and maybe also more fun for people. And um, with this, I wanna highlight these four steps I introduced in the beginning, information, so data integrity, the story, be clear about the main message, the goal, so select encodings and charts which successfully transport it and make sure that with the visual form you engage people and that you also make sure that they interpret and comprehend the right thing with your graphic. And with this, I want to thank you, and I'm open for any question. All right, thank you, Cedric, for your great presentation. Uh, I just joined like a few minutes ago. Sorry, I couldn't <laughs> since the very beginning, but it's a great pleasure uh, having you here Thanks. with all K State students. This is super useful for us for what we do and. And it kind of like uh, shows a guideline on how to represent our re the research we do in a nicer way. So if there's any questions for Cedric, please feel free to drop them on the chat. I can just read them for him or 
just feel free to jump in and ask any any questions you might have. Exactly. Content or non-content of the slides, all fine. Or I would also be curious otherwise if there are no questions or to fill the gap. If if you are kind of like using these dynamite plots I've showed, if this is something you see in your field or um from people from the stats world, I often get this like, yeah, you should not rotate your bar charts. There are several rotated bar charts here. We want to keep the independent and dependent variables and um, strict on the y and x axis, things like that. Comments on that. So, so I, I have one question for you. And maybe yes, the, sure. The reason of my question might be because I joined like later on. So what what kind of software do you use for creating all of graphs you've been showing throughout the presentation? Yeah, uh, I covered it quickly in the beginning as this is a tool agnostic talk, but I'm I'm a ggplot person. So that's also how I came into this business more or less uh, doing fancy stuff or also less fancy stuff, but I'm working with ggplot on a daily basis. Um, yeah, but that's what I do. You, you, Hmm? Is yep. it everything ggplot or you combine it with something else for that's, some feature that you that's, cannot that's, handle? Yeah, that's that, that's definitely uh, something I'm oops, I'm changed um, um, more recently, basically. So lots of these graphics you see here, um, these are definitely all done because these are basic charts with ggplot. Just wanted to move to, um, so these are all done completely in ggplot. But the USGS one, for example, here, this is 97%, but I didn't take the effort to place these small maps there. It would be possible, but if you know a bit about ggplot, it's very difficult with the facets and moving the maps exactly there. So this would just take longer. And this is a once in a lifetime piece and not something I update regularly. I just decided to do it by hand. Um, so I used Figma for that or other people use Illustrator or Inkscape. Nevertheless, um, coding is perfect because it's a nice thing. You think always it's the once in a lifetime <laughs> adjustment you do, and then you have to do it again. So I usually do 90 to 100% uh, code based. And then especially with annotations and uh, the details, I often do them afterwards if it's not needed. I also um, work in collaboration with people or with clients who, who have shiny apps or directly automated reports with our Markdown and Quarto. So there we need to come up with, with a solution where everything is generated by code. So the answer is ggplot most of the time and then as much as possible while keeping in mind the efficiency. As I'm a freelancer, I need to be <laughs> to take care of that as well. All right, and scientists you. as well. <laughs> You're welcome. Is there any other question for Cedric? Hi, Cedric. Uh, I had to leave my computer Hi. now, but I have a question regarding uh, uh, that example that you show about the scatter plot, uh, the different techniques we can use to, to avoid over plotting. I had some mm -hmm. issues, for example, when I have, uh, I am comparing observed and predicted values of two different models. Uh, I, I cannot do any sort of aggregation if I want to have a uh, both like uh, clouds of, of points in the, in the same plot. Do you have yeah. any idea like to override that kind of issue when we want to aggregate but still have two different uh, kind of data sets? Yeah, that, that's that's a tough one. Um, so besides calculating some summary statistic, which you likely have considered and want to show all the raw data points for one or the other reasons. I think what would definitely work is some of the density contour lines. Um, nevertheless, it's a very rough estimate, right? But it would basically highlight. So I think if you're really having two groups of very distinct patterns that could work, like having one in green and one in purple or whatever, and if they don't fully overlap and you might see, okay, one is going to one side and the other to the other side, that could work. It, it depends a lot on the data. It's the same with overall plotting. Um, so if you have in general also the problem that that you kind of like can't pick a transparency, which really is useful for both areas, um, then it's getting even more tough. If you kind of like not so much the worries about that, but it's really about overplotting, like having red points on top of blue points. If you're in the ggplot context, there's a recent solution for that with the ggblend package. 
Um, I don't know about other tools, but this basically solves a bit like um, this overplotting issue in terms of that you can't can't see the points which are at the bottom. So they're basically blending these uh, points so that you get a mix, mixed color. So this works very well with two groups. If you have more than two groups, well, then you come up with all kinds of color mixtures, which then also becomes um, yeah, difficult to interpret. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I would go, I would try density control lines or kind of like some blending depending a bit on the number of data points and also the patterns. Because these you can't use or just next to each other, which makes it a bit harder to really, to really match them. Great, yeah. thank you. So You're welcome. Well, we yeah. have two oh. more questions here on the chat. Mm -hmm. So Luis Felipe sure. is asking, do you have the gold materials available somewhere? Um, yeah, we'll likely upload this. So currently it's a, it's a, it's a remix of the workshop I give at the positive one, a much shorter one, but also again, I'm always putting in new <laughs> examples every time I draft a workshop. So um, yeah, it will be available on my GitHub. So when I share with you during the next days, give you a bit of time, um, the slides, I would also point you to the GitHub repository if you like. It's a bit of a mess likely here and there, but it should all work to, to generate the plots. Then, uh, okay, great. Um, so then Paula is asking, which program would you recommend for making an oral presentation beyond PowerPoint? Yeah, that's that's a tough one. I'm, I'm likely not the best person to ask here because I'm a traditional PowerPoint user um, and then moved on to R, to the R environment. So if you're an R user, um, I definitely use Sharingan and with R Markdown. I think Quarto now is perfect, especially if you have a combination of code and um, content. Uh, I mean, the, the nice thing about like Google Sheets, PowerPoint and these things is obviously that you can easily collaborate, right? And you can use the software everywhere. Um, I think Quato, which is using the JavaScript library, reveal JS in the back. Um, and you can also use it in combination with other programming languages, Python or Julia. It's wonderful. So these are also, these slides are also made in, in Quato. And nice thing is you can all kind of styling, you can directly embed the code, even show the code. There's a non-coding workshop, but even if I do a week long coding workshop, it's perfect because I don't need to copy my code in the slides when I, every time I update them. Um, and I think just like having HTML slides, it's pretty modern and nice with kind of smooth in terms of transition. So whenever I used PowerPoint, I was not happy about the functionality. And whenever I used another tool, it was often too much, but I also never have used one of these famous um, visual browser-based visualization tools. So there are, there are tons of them. So I think there are lots of good ones. I only used PowerPoint, Figma, which I found good for templating, but then not so nice in the presenting context because you only have PDF. And I really like the flexibility of HTML here. Yeah. Hope this helps somehow. <laughs> Thank you. I don't, you're you're I don't welcome. There's any other questions? Uh, I think I have one more here from Carlos. How do you sure. know that your plot is communicating well what you want to communicate? Do you have a strategy <laughs> to evaluate this? Yeah, that's, that's definitely a tough one. Um, and it's totally right and very fair question. I'm talking about, yeah, well, know your context, you don't know your audience. Um, but at the same time, it's not always uh, that easy, right? Um, and I would lie if I really would like test them every time, but that's the, usually my recommendation. So if you're collaborating, this is anyway the case, but I think also going outside of your collaborative bubble because they know the data also very well and often know the iteration where this graphic is coming from. So going to really your family, or if it's kind of need a bit more experts to colleagues in your department or maybe colleagues in the different department or something like this, asking them for feedback. And the important thing about these testing with um, feedback is that you don't tell them anything about the graphic or only the, the, the tiny amount they need to know. Because if you like, well, did, did you get that this is the main outcome? Then you're directly priming them what to see, right? Or if you ask them, so the, the best idea is really showing them the graphic for a short time, like 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes. And then afterwards asking them, what's the main thing they can remember from that, right? Tell them like, well, What's the key message you, you learned about that? And then they might say like, well, I learned that the oldest people are always having the lowest numbers. And I was like, well, yeah, that's not even true, maybe. <laughs> then it's even a burst. Or if it's not the main point of communication you want to set, then 
you need to iterate again, right? So I think like live testing and then with these encoding rules and these kind of things, we definitely have something to work with. Um, so we already know that some chart types are working better for one chart uh, data type or the other, right? So um, I think learning about this um, is definitely something and experience with this um, is definitely something which works also one um, draft title for this was uh, Nicolas mentioned to me was a world beyond bars. Um, and even though I rent, rent about, like to rent about bars here and there, I think bars charts, even though it becomes boring at some point are often still a good choice if you don't have too many comparisons, for example. So there's always a discussion about how much or if it's even allowed to use uncommon charts. So there are the people who say like, well, you should never use uncommon charts or more fancy charts because people can't read it. And then there's the other group which say like, well, if we don't show them these kind of charts then they will never learn. So um, again, I think it depends a lot on your audience and the medium as well, like what, what works and what doesn't. So make sure that you also kind of target the right people here. So, and especially scientists forget easily how difficult it is for people to interpret um, box plots, log scales, and even heat maps, what I mentioned, this was something I really had to learn because for me, it was always obvious that the darker the color, the more or something like this. But I really showed these to people and they, they, they were like indicating to me that they have no clue how to, how to read these kind of tables, which is basically a color and code table, right? And for most of you, it's the same. So I think really distressing this audience and context um, bit is really the most important besides all the other nitty gritty details you can get wrong. I think if, if this is something you really try to account for, like what's the story and to whom am I talking? Um, this is the most important. Then going back to the question, like trying to find a test audience with this setup would be the best. But I also know at the same time, often time is short. Um, the other people time or you like working on the graphic, being late one day before the presentation, right? Um, so then learning at least from that presentation for the next time is definitely something. So experience and um, yeah, asking your friends and colleagues. And also yourself, to add a more note, um, also yourself. I mean, that's definitely also something when people ask me like, yeah, why, how do you come up with this creative ideas or how do you know how this matches or doesn't work or something like this? Um, there's definitely some talent to that or some, some mindset, let's say, like if you're more worried about picking colors or not, or, um, but at the same time, also looking at other works, right? Looking at graphics, no matter if it's bad or good example, and just like, why does it work for me or why doesn't it work for me? Like learning from yourself, obviously it's a very small sample size, just yourself, but uh, you also will see like what people comment below data visualizations. If you a lot of social media, for example, or Reddit, and that's definitely also something like if there's a lot of people say like, well, not those critics, which are just wanna rant about it, but more like people, I don't get this. Then you like realize, okay, so at least this, it's a very broad and very general audience there, obviously, depending on the channel or the medium. But then, then you kind of directly sense, okay, well, it looks fancy or it looks cool, but no one is understanding that. And then it depends also what you want to do. I mean, there might be even a reason why you want to confuse people because they stop and take a closer look or you're creating this moment where people comment a lot, right? And algorithm push you. So in the context of social media attention, this is maybe even something you want to do. Um, and in terms of scientific or business um, findings, transporting these findings, um, it's likely nothing you want to do. So there's a huge variety also of, of that. Yeah. Okay, this was a long answer. <laughs> I hope I addressed it. <laughs> All right, Cedric. Well, I think we don't have any more questions here on the chat. Uh, Perfect. I mean, uh, in, in under the name of everyone that attended today and all the Kansas State Department of Agronomy, all the grad students and in particular the stats and programming committee who were the ones that put together the workshop would like to say thanks it was a great pleasure to having okay. you here uh, today and hopefully we'll get you back in the future <laughs> oh it will be cool wonderful i hope you learned something and it's dark here now but i think you still have quite some work ahead so enjoy your day <laughs>